Okay, so, well, good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dan Sperling as our keynote speaker for this evening as we continue our discussion about energy in the near and the long term and how to decarbonize it. And in particular, we're going to be turning our focus uh, a little more to advances in transportation that can help us achieve a cleaner energy future. Dan is the founding director of the Institute for Transport Transportation Studies at UC Davis, and uh, the Institute is celebrating 25 years of research on travel behavior, transportation systems modeling, uh, electric vehicles, climate change, and air quality. Uh, Dan has held the automotive engineering seat on uh, the California Air Resources Board since 2008, and in that role designs and oversees the state's climate change, alternative fuels, land use, zero emission vehicle program, and other programs. And he's also been the co-director of the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, and uh, I was fortunate enough to work with him on the National Low Carbon Fuel, uh, fuel Study that uh, was uh, funded by the, um, uh, uh, what was it, the Energy uh, Foundation, that's right. Um, and in, in June 2013, uh, Dan was a recipient of the Blue Planet Prize from the Asahi Gla Glass Foundation, which is a prize described as the Nobel Prize for the Environmental Sciences. Uh, in 2010, he received the Heinz Award for his research on alternative transportation fuels um, and for his uh, role in, in inducing adoption of cleaner transportation policies in California and across the U.S. Dan is recognized as a leading international expert on transportation technology assessment, energy and environmental aspects of transportation and transportation policy. He has testified many, many times to the US Congress, state legislators, and has authored numerous, numerous publications and more than, uh, you know, and several books. Uh, his PhD was in transportation engineering from UC Berkeley, and um, you know, he's widely cited in leading newspapers. He's been interviewed many times, been on the television, and uh, just given a new, you know, many, many talk shows and so on. So we're really honored to have him here this evening, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Sporling as our speaker. So many of you would probably think I'm a fallen academic because no real academic does all those kinds of things. Well, on my way here, um, I thought I was really well prepared. I knew what, knew what I was going to talk about, who I was talking to. And then I realized, you know, I've never been to Illinois except for Chicago and you know, that low carbon fuel standard ran into some problems with the corn farmers. They weren't real happy with some of the things that we were saying and doing. And, I, and then I started getting a little more apprehensive. And then I was coming here with, in an Uber car and talking to the driver. And she had never heard of Tesla. And uh, I thought, hmm, maybe I have misjudged my audience here. So let me get started here. Okay, how many people have heard of Tesla? All right, I'm reassured, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, how, are there any Uber drivers here? Uh, there's you, I, have a couple, I have a couple graduate students of mine that drive for Uber and Lyft uh, part-time. How many have a, an electric or plug-in hybrid car, a Volt or Leaf or? Tesla, oh, quite a few, okay. How many hybrid cars? Oh my gosh, wow, this is really, I guess I'm in a university, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I am gonna talk about the passenger transportation system. So uh, we've got quite a, I'll try to leave a fair, quite a bit of time in Q&A, but I, and so I deal with most aspects of transportation. So if you wanna talk about freight or, Biofuels, a favorite topic in, in, the, in this uh, campus. Be happy to talk about all of that. But let me uh, get started just giving a few little simple observations just to set the stage here. One is transportation just gained the honor, if you want to call it that, of being the largest sources of, source of greenhouse gases in the US, the largest sector 
uh, going past electricity this year. Um, another observation is that California, just a few days ago, adopted a new law that requires a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases in the state by 2030, which is you know, quite extraordinary. Um, but it, in a way of thinking about that is it probably requires about a 40% reduction in electricity and about a 40% in, in transportation. So very aggressive. And then I would add the additional observation, though, that the transportation system, that's where I've done most of my research over the years. I've always focused on transportation as it related to energy or the environment. I'll make the observation that there's been almost no innovation in the transportation sector in many, many decades. And when I say no innovation, yes, cars have become safer and more comfortable uh, as artifacts, but functionally, they're virtually unchanged. Four wheels, same carrying capacity, same speed. And transit, you could say the same thing about. Roads, the same thing. But what's amazing, and what I'm going to talk about today, is that change is starting to happen in the transportation sector. It's kind of like what we heard at lunchtime, that the information technology revolution is making a lot of new things possible. Well, it made a lot of things new possible in a lot of sectors, but not transportation until very recently. And so now we see the transportation really is on the cusp of, of massive changes. And most of them are going to be positive, but there's some that might not be. And so, that's part of what I'm going to talk about here. So transportation, part of to understand the transportation sector, you have to understand its roots are in civil engineering. And building bridges, pavements, and the most recent major innovation of civil engineers is the interstate highway system, limited access network across the country. One outcome of this focus of civil engineering and transportation on building roads and bridges to accommodate cars is, guess what? We've got a lot of cars. And in fact, cars have essentially vanquished everything else for passenger travel. So now, I come from California, well, originally from upstate New York, but I've been in California many years, but in Northern California, and I make that distinction because it was really Southern California that was the birthplace of car-centric transportation, where they built the city around the car. And now, of course, there's a lot of, you know, Houston, Phoenix, a lot of the Sunbelt cities, and most of the suburban areas through, through the entire country are now very much car dependent. So anyway, we've ended up with a transportation system very car dependent, and in fact bec has become more so. So here you see data from 1980 through 2012, and you see that of the, all of the passenger travel, almost all of it is driving alone. And in fact, the amount of carpooling actually shrank over that time. The amount of public transportation shrank over that time, even though this was a period in which a lot of money was being put into building carpool lanes in a lot of cities, putting a lot of money into transit. And yet here we are now with mass transit providing only 3% of total passenger travel in the US. We talk about pass uh, transit as being a major modal option. But in fact, if you look at it overall, it's only 3%. And most of that is in center cities, Chicago, Manhattan. And it's not just the United States that has become so car dependent. The rest of the world is following behind. The graph there, that's from a book I did a few years ago called Two Billion Cars. And what it shows there is that the number of vehicles increasing. And what's important about that is not so much the numbers, but the slope of that curve. And the point of that is, if we think we've got problems dealing with 
petroleum, greenhouse gases, pollution, it's only going to get a lot worse if we stay on this path. Here's just some images of you for you to kind of, so you can picture what I'm talking about. So that um, photo there of the freeways, that's a real intersection in Los Angeles. And the reason why it looks so outrageous is because a number of years ago, they decided they were gonna build carpool lanes, HOV, high occupancy vehicle lanes. And so that's on the, you know, the left side of the, of the lanes and you can't have all those people crossing over back and forth. So they had these flyover, so they have the carpool lanes flying over. So you can see flyovers all over the place there. Billion, just for that intersection, billions of dollars. And it's not just Los Angeles, not just California. Down that other photo you see there, that's Brasilia, built in the 1950s, built around the car. So just to really get that image in your head, <laughs> this, is, this is how far we've gone in car dependency. Now, if that person would have would get out of that car, they'd save money, they'd say, use less oil, less carbon, and they'd be healthier. But just so you don't think that this is just an American problem. <laughs> Actually, an MIT colleague gave that to me. <laughs> All right, so we've created a transportation system and I'll call it a monoculture because if transit is 3% and taxis and everything else is less than 1%, that's pretty close to what I'd call monoculture. Just like all that corn we were hearing about this morning. And it's a really, it's an extraordinarily expensive and carbon intensive and resource intensive uh, way of providing mobility. And if you look at it just in terms of the road cost, in this country we're spending over $100 billion every year on road infrastructure. We're spending, each of us, the average cost of owning and operating a car is $9,000 per year. Each of us is paying about $9,000 a year for each car we have when you take into account depreciation, and insurance and, and fuel and so on. And that adds up to over a, a trillion dollars per year. Oil, we're spending, even with low oil prices, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars every year, every year on uh, fuel for our vehicles. And climate change, about a third of all the greenhouse gases come from transportation and air pollution, about half the urban air pollution is from vehicles. Actually, that's not exactly right anymore. It used to be over a half and it's been slowly diminishing because one of the really impressive engineering accomplishments of this last 50 years is that cars and trucks are almost zero emissions now in terms of air pollutants. And so that's a, a tremendous success story, environmental success story. Now, to emphasize that point about going forward, Southern California. So Southern California has kind of seen, seen the, the, the sins of the past and understand that they have gone too far. And they have started spending a lot of money on transit, in fact, over half of all of the transportation money in the Los Angeles area is for transit. Now, the fact that only about 5% of the passenger movement is by transit kind of should give one pause. But they are, they've gotten desperate in terms of what to do about it. So looking forward, just like Los Angeles is looking forward, California, the United States, you know, we heard about the Paris Protocols. 
we're all looking forward to how do we create a more sustainable energy system and a sustainable transportation system. And I'm here to say that the modelers don't really know, the policy people don't know, the scientists don't know. It's pretty wide open. And this is just uh, some energy systems models that were brought together uh, from around the country to look at uh, different uh, scenarios going forward. And you can see business as usual and then a set of others. Dramatically different numbers in terms of energy use and greenhouse gases. So my point is that we need to really do a lot of thinking. We need more understanding, more research to figure out how to go forward. So I'm going to talk about going forward here. A good way of thinking about transportation is we can think of it as a three-legged stool. Think about it in terms of the vehicle use, the mobility, the fuels, and the vehicles. And we, and you know, just for the engineers and analysts in the in the audience, you know, those are the metrics we would use. And you just multiply those together to get the total amount of carbon emissions, your greenhouse gas emissions. And so I'm going to just quickly go through these, and then I'm going to focus on a, a few issues in particular. So one of it is vehicle use. A couple years ago, many of us were getting quite excited because it looked like we really had turned the corner, that vehicle use was really going down. In fact, it was going down very sharply. The Now, the the... The main curve there is total VMT for the US. So you can see that it peaked around 2006 or so, and then it went down, and then it start, has just started to go up again. And there's a lot of news stories about it, you know, that, you know, all of that good news now is, you know, we're just headed back to the old days. But in fact, it's a, that is misleading because if you look at the other curve, the vehicle miles traveled, VMT is vehicle miles traveled per capita, we're still way below what we were 10 years ago. So yeah, it started to go up a little bit, but it's still much lower. But this is a key issue, is, is vehicle use. Another key issue is where the fuels come from. And that was getting a little problematic, disconcerting until recently also because it looked like we were not decarbonizing our fuels, but we were recarbonizing or carbonizing them. We were moving to higher carbon fuels. The, the, fuel, the oil sands from Canada, the Arctic oil, which requires tremendous amount of energy to get it out. Well, oil sands is, is probably pretty flat. The Arctic oil, it looks like it's being pushed off into the future, maybe for a very long time. Um, and it turns out the shale oil and shale gas is really no, is about the same as conventional oil anyway. So that part of it's not quite as bad, but we would like to go to lower carbon fuels. The third part, the third leg of the stool, the vehicles themselves, are actually a, a great success story. Not only are they emitting less local pollution, but they're becoming much more efficient. So the, the speaker this morning from General Motors, even though I disagreed with his final conclusion, his observation and his story about all that GM is doing to make vehicles more efficient is exactly right. Every single car company is doing that. Cars. They're, they're introducing lightweight materials, better transmission, better combustion. And in fact, every new car and light truck that's produced, uh, not only in the United States, but in Europe, in China, in Japan, Korea, in all of these countries, all of the major markets, they're becoming much more efficient, every new model that's brought out. So on average in the US, every new uh, every year, the vehicles are about 4% more efficient than the previous year. And we have laws and regulations in place all the way through 2025, and, and I'd say that it's very likely that that trajectory it will continue after that. 
So this is a huge success story. The challenge will be to maintain that, but, but it's a, it's a, we're on the right path there, which is the only part of that, this that's really on the right path. In terms of vehicle use, we're kind of flat, and, and, uh, and uh, fuels, we're not doing a very job moving to low carbon fuels. So how do we create transportation systems that are cheaper, better, more sustainable? We want to make them less expensive, less resource intensive, less carbon intensive, and more accessible. And that's an important point, not just, uh, well, for the US, but everywhere around the world. Because as we go to more car dependency, car centric uh, cities and living, that starts to marginalize a lot of people in a lot of places. So what I'm going to talk about here are the three transportation revolutions that are getting underway. So he, here's some of the revolutions of the past in transportation. Streetcars back in the late 1800s, you know, electric streetcars, cars, you know, the Model T roughly around 1910, 1908, airplanes around 1930, the limited access highways I told you about. And that's the last one. That's what I was telling you about. It's been 60 years since there's been any real major systems innovation in the transportation, in the passenger transportation se sector. And that's pretty shocking, uh, really. So, and, and to think I spent my, almost my entire professional career <laughs> working in an area with so little innovation. But times are changing. So we have three revolutions now underway. One is the vehicle electrification. The other is shared mobility systems, real-time Uber-type systems. And I mean much more than Uber, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But Uber, Uber and Lyft were the first step. They got their foot in the door, moving us towards a, a more real-time shared mobility system. And then automation. So the first revolution, electrification. We, we see every car company is coming out with new, new vehicles every year uh, that are elect either pure electric, pure battery electric, or plug-in hybrid electric, meaning like the Volt that we heard about, where they have an electric motor and a big battery, as well as, as, well as a combustion engine that runs on gasoline. So these are some of the cars uh, that have, these are the more prominent ones, including that little fuel cell car. And just to show that they're real, this is the fuel station near me. Five hydrogen cars lined up to be fueled. Mine is one of them. Uh, California is taking the lead in that, but the, the hydrogen fuel cell cars will be spreading pretty quickly. There's a lot of, Germany and California and, and Japan are the three leading places for hydrogen fuel cell cars. Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Mer Mercedes, Daimler, and Honda are probably the leading companies developing it and, and starting to market it. So just to let you know, I'm walking the talk here. So there you see me with my hydrogen car on the left. There's my wife with her Tesla, a company car. How's that for a good deal, right? <laughs> talk to your employers. <laughs> um, did I point out she's the owner of the company? <laughs> it was an easy you know, sell job. <laughs> and there's my bicycle. Uh, zero, all zero emission vehicles. So I just submitted, I inserted this uh, graph just a, a couple hours ago after I heard the uh, speaker from General Motors saying that battery costs were not improving and he was just plain wrong on that. It's really, it's, it's been really exceptional how fast the battery costs have come down in the last 10 years. So this is this study, a study that was done that's probably the most respected uh, study on, on to overall battery costs. And what you can see there is they've decreased from $1,300 per kilowatt hour 10 years ago to $400 last year. And some of the new, some companies are now supplying batteries at uh, just about $200. So, I mean, that's a pretty sharp drop 
in batteries that we're seeing, and the expectation is they'll keep coming down. Obviously nowhere near zero, but it's expected they'll get down to about 150 or so, you know, in five, six, seven, eight years. So that's promising and real. And so if you put it all together, this is kind of the, a simple uh, characterization of what's happening with our, with our light duty vehicles, our cars, SUVs, pickup trucks, vans. Uh, ICEVs is internal combustion engine vehicles, just our gasoline cars. They've been improving, they are improving about 4% per year. They, uh, the requirements, the national requirements and California requirements are for them to keep on that trajectory until 2025. I am glossing all over a lot of uh, little nuances here, and so if you wanna uh, test me out on them, uh, I'll, I'll be up for it. But basically, it's about 4% per year, and then uh, the expectation is, so it is expected that through 2025, the engineers and the car companies are doing such a great job, far better than anyone expected, including themselves, in terms of making those vehicles more energy efficient, that they barely see any need to shift towards electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles. So most of the compliance with that regulatory requirement through 2025 will be mostly gasoline cars. And now because of VW, it won't even be diesel. It really will be gasoline cars. But at some point, there's going to be a transition to electric and plug-in hybrid and fuel cell cars. And it's very likely that this is going to be a, a fairly smooth transition. So you see car companies bringing out all these electric vehicles. They're not really pushing them real aggressively. You know, they're, I wouldn't call them experiments, but they're not exactly full-blown commitments to them because they still do cost more. Those battery costs still are high. They are coming down, and they know they're going to be less in the future. So we see this future where it's very plausible that we'll see this 4% per year improvement up till 2050 or more. In California, so California, at least in the US, is leading the way, has a requirement that about 15% of the vehicles sold by 2025 have to be uh, these uh, what we call zero emission vehicles, actually plug-in hybrids, battery EVs, and fuel cells. And it's not just California and, and even, nor the US even. In fact, China now is the largest producer of electric vehicles and actually, so that's the green color there, and they've come on very strong, that was last year, and they're forecasted to double their sales this year. And most of the largest manufacturers of electric vehicles in the world now are in China. So, uh, so we used to hear that, you know, whatever we do, we can't do energy efficiency, we can't do alternative fuels, we can't do, uh, greenhouse gas requirements because it's going to disadvantage us relative to the Chinese. Well, I think we're starting to see a, a different story that the Chinese are starting to make these investments uh, more than us. And just uh, kind of the, the, the electric vehicle story is still an uncertain one, how fast it's going to unfold and how. But one of the interesting things is Tesla announced this model, it's Model 3, uh, a few months ago. And they said, you can put $1,000 down and to make a deposit for this car. And, it's, you know, and then you can get it in two or three years. And amazingly, 375,000 people sent a $1,000 deposit for this car. I mean, that's $375 million they gave to Elon Musk interest-free. <laughs> That's what my, how my wife puts it. She says, I get it. Elon needs the money. I know it's an interest-free loan, but he needs it, so uh, I'm over it. I don't... <laughs> and, uh, but it does suggest that, you know, there is, seems to be a lot of interest, and General Motors is coming out with its car that's equivalent this December, so that'll be a good question to see how well it sells. Revolution number two. Shared mobility. 
This to me is really exciting because this is bringing the information technologies to transportation, finally. And Uber and Lyft, Uber and Lyft, they're only four years old, or at least in terms of providing consumer, regular uh, consumer ser mobility services, only four years. And Uber, by the way, is now valued at $60 billion, more than almost all of the car company, the regular car companies. And what they do is, so how many have people have used Uber or Lyft? All right, so you know what it is. Okay, so, you know, by the way, I used it, you know, I had trouble getting into uh, the university here from California, the connections weren't good. I flew into Indianapolis, took Uber here, it was $110, you know, from Indianapolis, and, uh, you know, for a two-hour ride, and I didn't have to drive, I got, got chauffeured. So, I, that's the good and the bad, actually. The good is, they're really introducing low-cost, easy transportation mobility. The bad news is those drivers are not making <laughs> very much money, and that's, that's kind of a bigger issue here. I'm not, you know, I can get into it in the Q&A if you want to, but it is this bigger issue about what's happening with our country as, you know, we have the have and have-nots and, the, and the, the equity issues about how our society is evolving in terms of income and so on. But in any case, so Uber is part of that narrative, but meanwhile, it is revolutionizing transportation. Uber, I call Uber a glorified taxi. So it's not really revolutionary in, this, in, in, in that sense, because it is just a, a much better taxi. But what it does is, it now is getting people accustomed to the idea of using it, and now they are moving towards what they call Uber Pool. Lyft calls it Lyft Line. And this is where you have multiple uh, riders in the vehicle. And why I'm so excited about that is because this is a case where the public interest seems to be aligning with a business model. The, car, the Uber and Lyft are looking at it that they think people are so price elastic in their demand that if they can just bring the price down a little bit, they'll generate a lot more ridership and therefore a lot more revenue and a lot more profit. So they're desperate to get that price point down. So if they can get multiple riders in the same car, they can reduce the price. So if you do Uber pool, that $115 ride might have been half of that if it was a Uber pool uh, ride. And so now we're opening up a future where we really have something that is a complement or even a replacement for conventional transit. Conventional transit really only works well in certain circumstances where you get a lot of den population density and you have a dense corridor, two dense nodes. It doesn't work very well anywhere else. It's really expensive to provide transit in other kinds of settings. So here's a case where we can fill in the gaps, we can complement it, connect up, first, last mile. It's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of companies coming into existence called sometimes microtransit companies that have vans a little bigger than an Uber car. So there's a whole world opening up here. And so it's actually, I, I put in some freight examples too because it's happening on the freight side as well, but especially on the car side. So we have a situation where we're moving from a car-dependent, car-centric transportation system to one where there's a lot more choice. So you have car sharing where you can get a car just for certain trips or certain purposes. You have the Uber and Lyft type services. Uh, as they expand, you can have the microtransit. Actually, I did this slide for my book many years ago. So this slide is 10 years old now. And so what I had called smart paratransit, we would now call microtransit. And we're creating choice. What's more American than choice, right? And it's great for the travelers because now you can not be dependent on that one car. You can have multiple, you can have access to multiple vehicles through car sharing. 
it's much more comfortable and easier to use these services many times. My wife and I sometimes, if we're going out to dinner, we're gonna have a bottle of wine and celebrate, to, oh, let's just take Uber and not worry about you know, driving, you know, drinking and driving. And so we use it just for that purpose, for instance. So kind of my rough assessment, I don't, haven't done a model to be able to quantify this yet, but I'm thinking probably half of our travel could be replaced by these new mo mobility services because there's all kinds of reasons people use it. The example I just gave, actually the, the, pri the peak ridership on Uber and Lyft is on Friday and Saturday nights when people are going out partying and a lot of young people are going out clubbing and so on, and that's where they actually have their most ridership. And for the economists in the crowd, you, deal, you should love them because they've introduced uh, uh, marginal cost pricing. They now charge uh, like Friday and Saturday nights. They bump their prices up 50 or 100% or 200% to try to balance the supply and the demand, just what we've all been preaching for all these years. All right, third, third uh, revolution is uh, the automation. And this is going to become more and more controversial, I think. There, there's a lot of people invested in it. There's a lot of potential good, but there's ways it could play out that are not in the public interest. So here's an, an analysis that was done and it, show, it breaks it down in terms of different variables and components of, of the use of the vehicles and different uh, activity. And what you see is in men, the, on the left side, that's reducing greenhouse gases and energy use, but on the right side is increasing it. So think about it. If there's a car available that drives itself, you know, that that 60 or 80 or 100 mile commute doesn't sound so bad anymore, does it? You just sit there, you do your work, you can text legally and safely, you can sleep, uh, read an ebook, watch a movie. So it starts becoming very attractive. You know, you can even picture it. It can be a hotel room for you, it can be an office. Um, all of a sudden, it becomes much easier and much more comfortable and desirable to be in your car even more than now. So it's pretty easy to imagine a scenario where there's actually a lot more vehicle use. Well, there's a lot of question how this is gonna play out. You know, don't believe the media. The media is, gets all excited about automation, it's something new. Um, and every new announcement, and you know, a lot of the industry people feed into it and say, oh, we're gonna have an automated car in two years. Tesla says, I have it already. Mercedes says, I've got it already. Well, those are not fully automated cars. So I've driven in those automated cars. And yes, it works most of the time on the freeways, but it doesn't, observe traffic signals, doesn't <laughs> detect traffic signals or traffic signs. And it, uh, so it works great, or pedestrians for that matter. <laughs> it works great on freeways, or it works pretty well on freeways, but it does not work on local streets. And they've got a long, long ways to go where they're going to really be safe. And that's even before you get into dealing with regulators uh, safety regulators, insurance companies, and local governments, and so on. So there is, I, I, I predict it's gonna be a while before you can actually go out and buy a fully driverless car, meaning one that you don't have to have a driver's license for or don't have to sit in the driver's seat. I think it's gonna be a while. But there are going, there are, almost every car is going to be partially automated uh, going forward. So the question is, are these three revolutions in the public interest? And I think, as I told you, the vehicle electrification unequivocally, yes. Uh, almost any case in any situation, even China, where they have mostly coal for electricity. There's mobili for mobility sharing, I'd say mostly yes. 
as long as they move beyond the glorified taxi mode and the automation, it could be. The ideal will be if we can merge them all together so that we have an automated car that actually will transport multiple people. It'll pick people up and take them where they're going and drop them off, and it's electrified. Now we're talking about a sustainable transportation system. So one of the big, big questions going forward, though, is, is us as consumers. Because at the end of the day, someone's got to buy these vehicles. Someone's got to make these choices about bicycling or using shared mobility. And the reality is we don't put nearly, I'm in a university, right? We don't put nearly enough research into understanding behavior because at the end of the day, it's going to play a huge role. And we don't have, I mean, the, the forecast, if you go into any of these big models, these energy systems models, they have almost no behavior built into them and very little on innovation. And so that's why you get graphs that go off into the future in all kinds of different directions. So this is some of the older folks in the crowd will appreciate this little graphic here. That's Pogo from the 1970s. Said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And that's, that's kind of pejorative, but it makes the point. And the last big point I want to do is leadership, because we need leadership to make, to make sure that these revolutions, that these investments, that innovation processes, that behavior moves in a direction that's in the public interest. So the vehicle revolution, so I've become a policy wonk. So I said I'm a fallen academic. I guess that's another definition of it. And I've gotten very much involved. And I look at these things, and policy, and all these things we're talking about, makes a huge, huge difference. And we really need to get policy right. And we need to bring science to the policy process. And we're doing a very poor job of that in Washington, in Springfield, in Sacramento. And we need to do a much better job. So we've got the vehicle revolution, the new mobility issues, automation. And part of this is kind of a, a plea of sorts, especially in this university audience. Those of us in academia, some of us need to put more effort into crossing that chasm between the research world, the university world, and the government world, and the policy world, because I've been working now part-time on the government side in Sacramento, and I'm just stunned at how little of the research that we do in universities actually makes its way into policy and, and decision-making in government. And that's irresponsible. It's, you know, it's irresponsible for all of us. And it, the blame goes to everyone. It's on the government side, on the university side, different cultures, different reward systems. But this is just a plea that, you know, those of us especially that we, you know, you get into your 40s and 50s and you be a brilliant researcher, publish lots of stuff, got your tenure, maybe now it's time to start thinking about how to use that expertise uh, you know, in, in, in bringing it to the policy world. Not everyone, but more of us. Thank you very much, and I'll leave you with that little thought from Albert Einstein. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. Can you um, give us a little bit of your perception of the the ride sharing, car sharing enterprise like Zipcar and Car to Go, and where are they where are they going? Are they doing better or are they sort of flatlined? The car sharing Zipcar is the probably the largest. Car to go is from Mercedes, and that's that's actually a, a in, it's a good innovation. It's a one-way car sharing. So if you do it from Zipcar, at least until now, you get the car. You have to you go somewhere. You have to bring it back. 
now there's new services where you can, it's a one-way service. You take it somewhere, you drop it off, and you can leave it there, and you can pick it up or go somewhere else in some other way. It's, um, it's conti they're, they're in continuing to expand. I think the problem we have is that the car, the car is so good in terms of freedom, flexibility, uh, convenience that it gives us, that no one alternative com can compete against it. Transit can't compete except in some very special circumstances. Car sharing can't compete. You know, if you already have a car or multiple cars, why would you do it? So it only makes sense if you get rid of a car or get rid of all your cars and start thinking about that set of choices. Okay, remember I told you about cho how important choice is. So if you have car sharing and you have Uber and Lyft and other kinds of microtransit services and the conventional transit, so uh, as well as maybe one car that you keep, now you've got a whole set of options that are actually a better option. You can, if I was king, and I could say, okay, I'm gonna control the set of options available. I bet for almost everyone, I could provide transportation that's as good as what you have now, if not better, at less cost by providing this set of mobility services. Because right now you're paying that $9,000 a year. You give me $9,000, if it, all of you gave me $9,000, I could create a transportation system that would be great for you, you know, better in, in, in most ways. So that's kind of the challenge we have here, is that we're kind of waiting for all of these multiple services to evolve. And that's why Uber and Lyft and these microtransit, I think, are, are really the key to it, because they have to become as avail more available so that you do feel com and reliable you know, when I actually I flew in, in Indianapolis, and I was nervous, you know, what if there's, you know, what if Uber decides not to operate or no cars are available, or they have some of that marginal cost pricing and they're gonna, you know, charge me double or triple. Um, so I have to feel comfortable that these services are available. And then, then I'll be willing to give up a car or two. So, uh, uh, so great talk, Dan. Thank you very much for that. So, so it's interesting to think about these three revolutions. Um, on the vehicle electrification, I just wonder if you have any comments on research by Aaron Manser and others who have looked at the pollution reduction benefits of an electric car versus uh, uh, ICE in different parts of the country. And they basically argue that except in California, uh, Maybe in New England, you have you have lower pollution and lower greenhouse gas emissions with internal combustion engines, uh, given the state of electricity uh, today. Clearly, that can change. That's one question, and and then on the the shared mobility. Why don't I just answer that, and I'll let okay. you do the next one. You know, a good researcher is one that works with data. So, and economists in particular, they love to get some data set they they can crunch. So they're going to go and look at the electric vehicles that are on the road now. And they're gonna look at the grid system on the, that exists now. And yes, you're gonna come up with lots of stories and situations where electric vehicles are not so compelling or attractive. You can go to, go to China and it'll be even more. The whole, th everything we're doing here is going towards the future. So the new electric cars are far more efficient than the old ones. The, you know, like when they do those analyses, they have climate control uh, systems in those cars that are really inefficient. The new ones are getting much more efficient. The grid is getting decarbonized. And so, um, so yes, it's good, good analysis, but it's, it's not really necessary. The grid has changed much because we already had the natural gas revolution, but I take your point that looking okay. forward, we should see okay. greater changes. Number two. <laughs> uh, on the shared mobility, if it simply leads, we can have fewer cars on the road, but if it simply leads to more vehicle miles traveled overall, is, is that a plus or a minus? It's a plus certainly for consumers, but environmentally, I just would love a comment on that. And then where do walkable communities come into play in terms of thinking about transportation and urban, uh, urban design and, and, 
and building centers, uh, cities and towns where people can walk to shops and things. Is that, is that going to be an important phenomenon? Yeah, okay, so the, the last one. So walkable communities. We've turned the corner with our cities in this country, you know, for a long, well, for well into the 60s, the cities were declining and there was problems with crime and and the urban renewal projects were often misguided. But in the last 20, 20, 30 years, um, most of the cities are, have been on an upward swing in terms of becoming more livable places and people are moving back. And it creates an opportunity. So yes, so a walkable, so I moved just actually a few years ago actually to Davis. I used to commute for many, many years. And I was kind of skeptical myself. Yeah, you know, all my colleagues talking about all this walkable community stuff and this livable community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there really is something to it because it is that idea of community. You're part of the community. Uh, you walk, you bike, um, and you feel more engaged. I think human beings like that. So there's something beyond just things that we can quantify. And then, of course, if we are walking and biking, we are re reducing the VMT and we're reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, and, and it's probably good for elderly people because they have more access in a lot of cases. So I think it's mostly good. Your second, what was your second question? Uh, yeah, in the abstract, more VMT is good because it, show, it means people are getting more access and so on. But as I was trying to illustrate with that SUV with a, walking a dog, I, I think we've gone way too far. And if we truly priced transportation, we would see a lot more travel if we priced it correctly. We're not, probably not going to do that, so we do it through other second best means. And, uh, you know, just, it's kind of the American thing, you know, cars are right and driving is a right, but I think people have lost track of what's really important to them. Some people. I don't want to be like Hillary Clinton and make these generalizations that, uh... <laughs> Technical question on your hydrogen car. What's the pressure in the tank on that vehicle? Um, so the it's twice what the CNG tanks are. So it's uh, seven thousand, uh, no, ten, or ten thousand psi. So it's uh, it's high pressure, <laughs> and it refill time is about five, four or five minutes. So it's. You know, we used to talk about safety concerns and these high-pressure tanks, but I, no one seems worried anymore. You know, I've been around long enough that I remember, you know, all those concerns, but Toyota does not sell a car if they have worries about liability. And the fuel stations are all self-serve. They don't impose any restrictions. I thought they would impose a restriction to have you park it in a... They would tell you not to park it in a well-insulated place because then the hydrogen, if there's hydrogen leakage, it could be built up. But they don't seem to think there could be any hydrogen leakage. So seems good. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, very nice talk, uh, Dan. Thanks. I, I appreciated your slide about. Uh, understanding consumer choice, because obviously that's a, a research area of my own when you relate to transportation. You mentioned in the slide uh, down below, you, you mentioned Jim Salee's work on rational inattention. You mentioned loss aversion by David Green, both behavioral biases. What's your thinking based on, on what's out there now about how consumer choice, behavioral biases, and what that means for policy? What it means for policy is that we need intervention. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds really paternalistic, right? But if you look at vehicle standards, so if we use what the gentleman from General Motors said, um, we do know that uh, in observing behavior that it is true 
that people want to return in two or three years for any extra cost they bear in term for improving the efficiency. In, in other words, if you're going to, like he said, if you spend a thousand dollars to make the vehicle more efficient, you want to make that money back in two to three years through fuel savings, gasoline savings. And that seems, you know, that has been the case. It, from a societal perspective, it makes no sense at all. Even from that person's perspective, it probably doesn't make it. You know, they can rationalize it that, well, maybe I'm going to sell the car in two years and I want to, I worry about the resale value and things like that. But overall, it's, it's really not in the public interest. And in fact, the vehicle standards have been adopted, the so-called 54 miles per gallon in 2025. Um, the estimates are that it's, it'll cost about $1,100 to make that vehicle more energy efficient to, re, to, uh, to meet that 54 MPG standard but they're gonna save many, many thousands of dollars in fuel. And so they, they come, society comes out way ahead, but the individual consumers come out way ahead. So what do we do about that? And so it does suggest that setting, okay, I'm a policy wonk these days. When I look at policy, the best policy, all, all things equal, is a market-based policy that changes market signals so that people understand the full cost of what they're buying and using. We often, for many, many reasons, that's not possible politically or even technically. So then we go, next best are performance-based standards. And that's what these greenhouse, that's what these cafe standards and greenhouse gas standards are, they're performance-based standards. Every car company has to meet a certain miles per gallon for their vehicles. And in, on top of that, they're actually allowed to buy and sell credits. So if they beat the standard, they can sell credits to another company. So they actually do uh, impart you know, a carbon price. Uh, it's not really strong, but a fairly good carbon price. So that's, that's where I end up with policy, is that you, know, you, you start with the best, and then you, in the, in the US at least, you quickly go to <laughs> to these second best performance-based standards, which, and then you throw in some credit trading, and you've got something that's you know, second best, but still pretty efficient from an economist's perspective, and, and very effective. And, he, and consumer taxpayers, or voters love it because it's all hidden away from them, so they think it's great. They think it the, just affects the car companies, so we can get it done. I would point out, though, by the way, we have automated cars now. That's what Uber and Lyft are. It just happens to be a human robot <laughs> driving. <laughs> You know, for an academic, I really spread broadly. I do a lot of, stop, try to solve a lot of problems, but that one's beyond, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but it is, it's a, it is this, you know, and that's what I was saying about what's disconcerting about these, you know, Uber and Lyft type services. They're part time, they're not paid very well. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's, part of a bigger problem and then if you do and then if they don't even have those jobs you know it's even worse so uh, what do I know <laughs> um, you haven't really touched on how to how to lower the carbon in, in freight and long distance travel like aviation and, and for that matter marine how do you how do you see doing that because that's still a if we eliminate all the light duty carbon there's still a big lump left I'm 
glad, I'm glad you asked that because I think that's where the biofuels go. We don't need, and I didn't say this explicitly, we don't need biofuels for light duty vehicles, for SUVs, cars. We've got great solutions for the battery electrics, the plug-in hybrids, the fuel cell electrics, um, from every perspective. But we don't have a good solution for long haul trucking or nor aviation. And that's where we're gonna need to bio. We need a high density liquid, ideally a high density liquid, energy dense liquid for long haul trucks. We could, on the long haul trucks, we could use fuel cells with, with, uh, with hydrogen, either high pressure or some other improved storage techniques. I think it could work okay, but it's, it's not real attractive. So I think that's where we need the biofuels to be going. Now, before the Second World War, there was a lot of work on electrification of rail, particularly in Europe. Now we have, since dieselization, people really haven't addressed electrification. Do you think electrification of rail will come back? I have a PhD student doing his dissertation on exactly that, and it's, it's, it's costly. So if you have a dense corridor, rail corridor, with a lot of trains, then you can amortize the, all the extra cost, you know, for the catenary and everything else. But when you go beyond that, it gets pretty expensive. So, you know, maybe we're willing to bear it, you know, if we start pricing it right, you know, maybe we should do that. May, the, the hydrogen in the fuel cell, if you get zero carbon hydrogen and a fuel cell is a possibility for rail also, uh, or just low carbon electricity, like you're suggesting. So it's a relative, it's only about, I believe about 2% of our uh, passenger energy uh, our, our transportation energy is, is railroads. So it's not a big piece of it, um, but important. So, um, Dan, let me ask you, um, I mean, I, I guess this question about, you know, why you see biofuels as not being the solution for light duty and, um, and electrification as being the way to go. And what, you know, Despite the policies we've had, the RFS, which is to promote biofuels, it's been this uptake has been so slow. In the case of electrification, we really don't have any major policy to to have greater electrification, except the technology push that might be taking place for other reasons. So, how do you see us moving, you know, faster in the electric vehicle space than we've done in the biofuel space? For so, I think the the vehicles, the cafe and greenhouse gas standards are going to be effective, will accomplish it. I think they're going to be the binding, they are going to be binding on the car companies. And, um, and I think the major, they're investing in it now because they know they have to make that transi transition to electrified vehicles. Um, in California and nine other states, we have a zero emission vehicle mandate, which required, I put one slide up there, that they have to produce a certain number of electric vehicles in the next 10 years. But the, goal, the role of that is really just to accelerate the commercialization process so that we don't get to 2025. And so in the words of a car company executive, he said, I get it. I said, he said, if we don't have a zero emission vehicle mandate, we're gonna get to 2025 and we're gonna say, oh gosh, we can't, you know, we've done everything we can with a combustion engine, lightweight materials. We need time now to figure out how to use the electric vehicles. So the role of the ZEV mandate is to smooth that transition to, to force the companies to, to keep them from procrastinating is a good way to put it, that they'll make those investments earlier than they would otherwise. But those vehicle standards, if we keep going at 4% per year, I mean, even if we don't go to electric, in theory, who cares? If they could make those gasoline cars 4% better every year, good enough for me. Now, in practice, I don't believe that will be possible. But uh, um, so I think that's the one place where we actually have a durable policy framework in place. And in this case, the car industry is largely bought into it. 
and they're making the investments. So this is a case where that path forward looks very plausible. The policy people in the industry are more or less aligned going forward. Unlike, okay, I'll, I'll even say it. Unlike on the biofuel side, <laughs> okay, let me, um, we have a few, uh, let me give one minute on biofuels since I know so many of you are interested in it. To me, the problem with biofuels is that we've not moved to the advanced biofuels because the investments haven't been made, not in, not in the R&D, nor in the uh, early, early uh, demonstration pilot projects, you know, because they're learn every one of those cellulose projects has run into all kinds of startup and scale-up problems, and almost all of them have gone bankrupt. And the problem is that not enough resources are being put into it, and the only industry that has the resources and the expertise is the oil industry. Uh, and they need to invest in biofuels if we're going to see advanced biofuels succeed. And until that happens, um, it's going to flounder, uh, I think. And, and the renewable fuel standard, the way it's structured, is it does not require the oil companies to do anything. All it tells them is that they have to buy it if it's available, the advanced biofuels. And so they have no incentive to invest. The one difference is California with a low carbon fuel standard, which does require them to invest, does require them a hard performance standard. And that's why there, it's especially controversial. Any oil company people here? <laughs> Let me ask you, do you see the oil industry investing to, um, to meet the low carbon fuel standard? In California, not or yet. That matter, British Columbia. Well, you know, they sued. They got and they so they got it held up at a very low uh, percentage. Was flatlined for a couple of years. So now it's just it's going to start in another year. It's going to be going up at a really steep rate. And it, they backloaded it. They, me, <laughs> I confess, I was part of it. But um, It's hard to know. I mean, some of the oil company, I think, eventually the oil industry will embrace biofuels. It makes sense because otherwise they're going out of business. As oil consumption slowly, it's going to be very slow, but certainly declines over time, what are they going to do? And biofuels, hydrogen are the most obvious um, fuels to be investing in. So we'll see. Okay, let me ask you about your hydrogen. What's the source ultimately of the hydrogen that you put in your 10,000 PSI tank? And what's the efficiency on creating that hydrogen? So, in Cali so the, there's a law in California that one third of the hydrogen must be renewable hydrogen. Um, some of it's made out of biogas, um, which is essentially z close to zero carbon. Um, most of the rest of it is made from natural gas. So the carbon life cycle, it's about, um, the last analysis I saw, it's about half the carbon footprint of a comparable car, uh, you know, gram CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Um, but the real key to it is going towards renewable hydrogen, and that's going to take a while. Um, and a lot more research and a lot more development is needed to bring down the costs of hydrogen. Right now, most of it's made from either natural gas or from the refineries, because the, the refineries make huge amounts of hydrogen, and they just pipe it out of there. <laughs> 